Okay, welcome everyone to today's uh, PCS IBS seminar. Uh, and uh, this seminar is the fourth and the last uh, seminar as a part of uh, our advanced study groups on uh, advanced study group on deep learning in quantum phase transitions. Um, and today it's a great pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Tomi Oktsuki. And I would like to invite our scientific host, uh, Professor Viktor Kagalowski, to introduce our speaker, please. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Tomi Aksuki. Uh, he's uh, the first uh, speaker for our advanced study group. Uh, Tomi graduated in 89 from the Tokyo University, spent some nice years as a postdoc in different places. And uh, for many, many years, he is already uh, the professor at the Sofia University in Tokyo. His contributions in Anderson transition studies, conductance fluctuations, various Hall effects are incredible. I already mentioned that he and his Slavin, their famous 2.62 critical exponent is still in the middle of the consideration and discussions and stuff like that. But recently, he addressed a very important question. Can the computer, can the machine tell us which phase are we are looking at, especially if we are in Anderson insulator or topological insulator? And he created machine learning approach, which allowed him to build a fa a fake phase diagrams, which included disorder and various parameters. And this will be the part of his talk. And as you can see, the title of his talk corresponds exactly to the title of our advanced study group. And for me, particularly very special is that he will be talking today also about how machine learning can address experimental results, how it can analyze experimental results and teach us what phase we are working with. Please, Tommy. Back. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Victor, uh, uh, for a very nice introduction. Uh, I would first like to thank Victor for inviting me and uh, giving, giving me this opportunity to talk about this topic. It's about uh, machine learning the magneto fingerprints in mesoscopic system. And, uh, actually, my contribution to this work is very limited, and most of the uh, work have been done by the experimental group at the University of Tokyo, led by Professor Eiji Saito and uh, Dr. Shunsuke Daimon. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, let me uh, begin with the uh, situation of the machine learning application to condensed matter physics. So uh, here is a, uh, a graph of the published paper in the condensed matter physics which have deep learning or machine learning or neural network in title, not only in title, not in the abstract, but only in title and pick up to the paper. And you see 2016, when I start the machine learning approach to condensed matter physics, there aren't so many papers there at that time, but there is a sudden increase of the uh, machine learning papers uh, from 2017, and uh, it's still uh, uh, increasing. Uh, not exponentially, but still it's increasing. And uh, so five years have already passed uh, since 2016. Well, uh, 2017 paper have been on archive in 2016, already in 2016. So five years have already passed since the application of the machine learning to condensed matter physics started. And now the detection of the phase, uh, as Victor nicely introduced my work, uh, we can now uh, detect the phase of the spin system and the quantum spin system, percolating system uh, and quantum percolation, as well as Anderson localization and uh, so, uh, topological system. So machine learning can uh, detect the phases. We can also apply machine learning to analyze the time series. 
So uh, this, this uh, technique is rather developed for analyzing the stock market uh, uh, time series of price, stock prices. But we can also use, uh, apply this uh, technique to the condensed matter physics, like analyzing the uh, time uh, dynamical property of the diffusion process. Okay, we can also express uh, or obtain the ground and the excited state wave function via uh, neural network. So we often uh, use uh, restricted Boltzmann machine, which was a topic in the previous ASG seminar. So machine learning are now uh, uh, reproducing, uh, reproducing already known results. But uh, for, uh, since it's already uh, around, uh, it's already been around for more than five years, it, I think it's time for uh, machine learning approach to predict something uh, completely new. Not only reproducing the known results, but we need to do something new. And uh, for this purpose, I think the interaction with the condensed matter experiment as well as high energy physics are uh, necessary. And high energy physics people are discussing the symmetry based uh, neural network uh, analysis. And, and also there are many experimental data which is so far uh, was difficult to analyze by the uh, traditional method. And here uh, I'm going to talk about uh, conductance fluctuation as an example of, of the interaction with the experimental physicists and uh, theoretical condensed matter physics. Okay, so uh, today I'm uh, sorry. Today I'm talking about analyzing the magneto fingerprint. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the magneto fingerprint, I will discuss a short introduction to. Uh, magneto fingerprints or uh, uh, quantum uh, uh, fingerprints, which appear in mesoscopic uh, uh, system. And uh, uh, I will uh, tell you uh, uh, the following uh, question. Can we guess the position of the scatterer? Here in this case, the position of the antidote by measuring the magneto conductance and without using microscopes. So usually when we want to uh, uh, see the uh, position of the impurities or antidote, we use microscope. But uh, can we uh, guess the position of the antidote by simply measuring the magnetoconductor? That's a, uh, quite uh, useful if it is successful, if we succeed in predicting the position of the antidote. And I, uh, uh, naturally, my uh, answer is yes, we can. But uh, first, let me uh, begin with uh, what is uh, magneto, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, magneto fingerprint. So uh, here is a typical example of Aharanov bomb ring. It's not a ring, but uh, here, here it's a square, but uh, the, topologically it's a ring, sorry. And if we apply magnetic field we, of the, the uh, oscillation of the magneto resistance R as a function of the flux, uh, uh, and which is typically uh, H over E a period. But in addition to this large period, we see some fluctuation of the data or the conductance. If we don't have a ring uh, uh, geometry, but uh, consider the quantum wire, still we have this fluctuation. And this fluctuation pattern look like noise, but they are reproducible and sample specific. And this uh, uh, oscillation pattern is called magneto fingerprint because each sample have different finger uh, different pattern of the magneto resistance, and uh, they are reproducible. Sample specific, but reproducible. 
I'm so sorry, I have a, just just, just yes. a, a short question. What is uh, yes. what is the uh, on the x-axis in the bottom right figure? Is that the uh, logarithm of the magnetic field, or what means minus seven? Uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, conductance. Uh, 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 conductance, oh, on the uh, uh, the, that's the conductance, sub, uh, and the average is subtracted. So I it's a fluctuation what? of the conductance. Right, but what is on the x-axis? Uh, x is a magnetic field. Yeah, what? Is that the magnetic field or some logarithm, or what is it? Because it says minus 7, uh, minus... Uh, it's just a linear magnetic field. I mean, yeah, what are these numbers lower. meaning? What means minus four? There is no minus four Tesla, yeah, right? It, so, it, it, the magnetic field is uh, in the opposite direction. Uh, the figure uh, uh, try to show the positive magnetic resistance, magnetic <laughs> field region, and the negative magnetic field region. And I just copied only the negative okay. region. So these numbers the are just- The 10 minus four, also, again, the 10 minus four refers to the average resistance. Right. Not to the magnetic field. Sorry, uh, I have an x axis and sorry. it says minus four. And now I'm just asking what does it mean? Minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one. What is that? Yeah, yeah, minus four Tesla. That is the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, is, uh, okay. so minus the minus is the direction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, minus direction. Uh, Thank you. Just want to show the symmetry. Uh, this is a part of the graph that shows the symmetry between plus B and minus B. Uh, Tommy, one more question. Uh, fluctuation of conductance with respect to what? To some average or? Yeah, some average value. Okay. So the average value is subtracted. So that's why it is minus. It can be minus. Okay. Okay. Uh, so please feel free to uh, interrupt me and uh, uh, give the question. So uh, the uh, naive uh, qualitative interpretation of the magneto, uh, 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 universal conductance fluctuation is as follows. Uh, the question is the sample to sample conductance fluctuation delta G, uh, are they, uh, or its variance delta G squared, are they proportional to uh, G or one over G or L? And for this uh, discussion, we introduce a soundless formula that the conductance uh, is L to the D minus two times the density of state power volume times the diffusion constant. And the density of state power volume times diffusion constant gives the conductivity. And this factor, a system size to the power dimension minus two, uh, uh, relate uh, the conductivity to conductor. Now the diffusion uh, constant, we introduce the Sowles time T Sowles, which is uh, which is a typical time for the particle to be inside the sample. And after uh, the, this Sowles time, the uh, uh, particles inside the sample diffuse away to the lead attached to the sample. We then introduce the solace energy, which is the uh, inverse of the solace time, T solace, and we write uh, this uh, conductance formula in terms of solace energy, and we get L to the square, which cancels this minus two, and this L to the D in volume, times the density of state per volume gives the density of state itself. So the conductance is uh, just the number of energy level inside the solace energy, NC, which I use NC. And so uh, since it's the number of the energy level inside the solace energy, if the energy levels are uncorrelated, then the fluctuation of G is the fluctuation of NC, which is uh, uh, square root of NC. So the conductance fluctuation will be square root of NC if the energy levels are uncorrelated. But we have energy repulsion in the metal system, and the energy levels are not independent, and they are correlated. 
and uh, this leads to the uh, uh, this uh, joint energy distribution distribution function gives you that uh, for large n the conductance uh, the energy level fluctuation is not proportional to square root of n but uh, square uh, log of n so the energy level fluctuations are much more suppressed than the uncorrelated case. So uh, we, we, this is a qualitative understanding of why the uh, conductance fluctuation is, looks almost constant. But uh, we can give a more sof sophisticated approach. Uh, we consider the two terminal conductance and consider the effect of the leads attached to the sample uh, more carefully or more uh, co quantitatively. And uh, the random beautiful formula gives uh, is as follows. It is a transmission coefficient matrix. Now, uh, uh, the eigenvalue of T dagger T, uh, I denote it as tau i. So the, we need to, uh, to discuss the fluctuation of the conductance we need to discuss the fluctuation of the, uh, eigen, the transmission eigenvalues tau i. And uh, this, uh, for the quasi one dimensional system, uh, this distribution is known. I, I mean, we first uh, trans, uh, transform tau i to lambda i, and this lambda i obeys this uh, probability distribution. Uh, beta is one, two or four, depending on the uh, time reversal symmetry or spin rotational symmetry. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, the fluctuation is given by uh, this formula, and uh, they are independent of the average of conductance, and they are uh, uh, not uh, dependent uh, depend on log g, but uh, it's uh, just a constant. And for a higher dimension, this is the result of the uh, quasi one dimensional system. But for the higher dimensional system, it is also uh, a constant, but this value is slightly, it becomes slightly larger as we increase the dimension of the system. So this is called the universal conductance fluctuation. Uh, Professor now, Oksuki, can I ask a question? Yes, so, uh, so, please. So, so is there any limitation here in these approaches uh, that you need to consider dilute impurities or it, it, it applies for any kind of density of impurities? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, thank you for asking me. The, the system needs to be uh, diffused. So uh, Diffuse. the electron sh should be scattered many times inside the system so that uh -huh. this random matrix theory applies to the Aha, uh -huh. so it's not the, the dilute limit, it's kind of the opposite. Yeah, it's it's a strong limit. scattering. We have always a number of channels. And mm -hmm. the, the conductance doesn't show any fluctuation. Okay, but, uh, thank you. As you point out, uh, it, uh, if we have a strong uh, random potential, uh, then the uh, uh, quasi 1D system always have a localization, Anderson localization. And this theory again doesn't apply. So the uh, so the con universal conductance fluctuation in quasi one dimensional one dimensional system is rather difficult to observe because if the uh, impurity scattering is too weak, then the uh, transport property is ballistic and doesn't obey the random matrix theory. If the impurity is too strong, then and the electrons are Anderson localized, and again, the random matrix theory doesn't apply. So the uh, uh, reason for the validity of this approach is rather limited. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, I, I have another question. Uh, yes, so on the, on the previous slide, you uh, argued that 
uh, assuming uh, assuming absence of correlations, you get uh, the square root of G. Uh, yes, you are, yeah. Then you say with level repulsion, you get a much a smaller uh, effect, which is logarithmic. And yes. now on the, on, on the following slide, uh, you come up with this uh, uh, universal conductance fluctuation, yes, yes, yeah. which are uh, a constant. But is this constant, what is it? Is it even smaller than the logarithm? Can you say that? or? Yeah, uh, even for the very uh, large n, it's uh, uh, the fluctuation stays constant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is because we take into account the effect of these uh, explicitly. In the previous argument, we consider a finite system and relate introduced T Saurus uh, and uh, Saurus energy, but that is not enough to uh, derive uh, the universal conductance fluctuation. Thank you. Okay, good. So that's the introduction. Uh, but in experiment, we cannot uh, prepare many sample and measure the uh, average conductance and variance of the conductor. So instead, we prepare a sample and apply the magnetic fields and vary magnetic fields like this. And there is a correlation magnetic field beyond which the magneto conductance is uncorrelated. That is, the magneto conductance is a continuous function of a magnetic field. If we pick up two values, which is very close to each other, then they are surely correlated. But uh, there is a order of magnetic field called uh, correlation field beyond which the sample can be regarded as an independent uh, sample. And by doing so, well, we can uh, uh, consider the uh, conductance fluctuation or discuss the order of the conductance fluctuation. Okay, and the question is, as a mean conductance, average of the conductance, it's variant, and the correlation field, the only information contained in this magneto resist uh, conductance. Well, the variance, as I told you, is a universal quantity. So it doesn't tell uh, much about the sample. So we don't have a lot of information. We, so far, we don't think that this magneto fingerprint does not have uh, information more than the average conductance and the correlation field. But uh, to, today, my topic is uh, to interpret, decipher this uh, mysterious uh, fluctuation and reproduce the position of the antidote. Uh, that is uh, 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 the topic uh, uh, today. So uh, let me go to the main topic uh, uh, today. So, uh, so the uh, motivation is uh, uh, whether we can read in the magnetoconductance and reproduce the quantum interference pattern. by using the machine learning. We also discuss uh, why, uh, what is, uh, what uh, this uh, pattern uh, contain in this reduced dimensional space, but this I will explain it later. Okay, the magnetoconductance, uh, we are not, uh, going to discuss the random impurity system, but we consider a system with uh, antidote. Antidote is a region uh, where the electrons are not allowed to enter. So it's like the situation of the quantum chaos or a chaotic system where a squared region is present and the orbitals become chaotic. And in the quantum system, we expect universal conductance fluctuation 
as in the case of random impurity system. I think that some of the audience are more familiar with that than me. So the, uh, my, our motivation is to uh, have uh, to prepare two antidotes and calculate the conductance, our magnetoconductance. And then from magnetoconductance, we try to teach the neural network to reproduce this pattern. Once we succeeded in training the neural network, then from the uh, uh, magnetoconductance, without knowing the structure of this uh, uh, antidote or position of the antidote, we are able to uh, reproduce the uh, position of the antidote. Uh, and as I told you, without using the microscope. Uh, I have okay. a question. Uh, these yes, antidote, antidotes, they are uh, what? They are artificially uh, brought into the system? Uh, yes, yeah, okay. yes. Uh, they are artificially uh, built in the system. So, so this is done by sample preparation, basically? Yeah, that's a sample preparation technique, yeah. Okay, and what is the size of such an antidote? Uh, let me... Uh, it is, so it, this is 20 nanometer. Okay. So uh, it's quite small, uh, something like uh, five nanometer. So, so, so they are brought into the system by the lab, uh, which is preparing the sample. Am I understanding that correctly? Oh, well, we first do the numerical calculation. So we into the, uh, prepare 8,000 oh. configuration. No, what well, I mean uh, is, yeah, well, 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 my question is the following. So uh, there is, uh, say, a sample which was prepared in a lab, and this sample contains one or few antidotes. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Who, who put these antidotes into the sample? The, the, the lab which prepared the sample, or do they? Yes, yeah, the experimental group prepared. But, uh, so then, to... then they kind of know where they are, right? So why do we want to reproduce that? Uh, 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 it's a first step to uh, reproduce. The first step is to reproduce the uh, sample uh, okay. uh, 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 and uh, compare the known position sure. and yeah. uh, re uh, neural network prediction. Once okay. they are satisfactory, then uh, we can detect the uh, position of the scatterers without uh, knowing the position. But then so, these scatterers, whose positions you want to predict, they are not any more antidotes. What are these scatterers then? Well, that, that, that we haven't succeeded. Ah, I uh, keep... uh, we, we are going to demonstrate that we can do it for the to antidote case. I see, thank you. Uh, to mm -hmm. predict everything, uh, we haven't succeeded. Uh, I think <laughs> it's, uh, at this stage, it's too ambitious, I have to say. Okay. Thank you. But uh, yeah, uh, thanks for asking me. Uh, you, you understand the problem quite correctly. Okay, uh, so uh, this is uh, how we simulate the uh, uh, conductance. We use quant as a standard Python package to calculate the transport as well as the scattering state. We, we consider the two antidotes and actually one position is fixed and the other one is varied uh, randomly inside the sample. Uh, for calculation, we consider the 60 by uh, 50 lattice and we add the wall. So, so that the original image is 60 by 60. So we have 60 points and 60 points. And in the, uh, so as an input, we have 3,600 data points as a vector. Now we uh, collect varying the magnetic field, we uh, obtain the conductance, our magnetoconductance. I wrote 100, but actually it's 101. But anyway, this is the scheme of the numerical calculation. We calculate 
the magnetoconductance and we also consider the scattering state. And this scattering state, uh, both of them are important uh, for training the neural network in our uh, system. Now, uh, 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 for each configuration of the antidote, we obtain different uh, magnetoconductance. Uh, uh, and the question is, uh, uh, although these look like noise, uh, uh, do they ha still have the information about the position of the antidote? And uh, if they have, can we decipher using the machine learning? So that is our question, uh, which I want to answer uh, in the next few slides. So uh, the traditional deep neural network uh, we, from starting from this uh, magnetoconductance, we try to, we first try to reconstruct the scattering state. So we fix the position of the antidote, and then we can calculate the magnetoconductance. And uh, the question is whether we, from this magnetoconductance, we can reproduce the quantum interference pattern. And the answer is no, I'm afraid. We can uh, predict this uh, position, but uh, this is fixed. So it's rather natural that we can do, uh, predict the position of this uh, first antidote. We see a shadowy region around here, but uh, still, uh, which corresponds to this region, but still, uh, it, it's not quite clear whether we have really an uh, antidote here or not. So the simple uh, neural network does not reproduce the position of the antidote correctly. Okay, so the first uh, trial of the simplest traditional neural network doesn't give us the correct answer. So we need to have something more, uh, something better. So uh, our neural network structure is not a uh, simple traditional one, but it, uh, it is a Y-shaped one. And we first train the neural network along this direction. We input the in, uh, scattering state or wave function image, and then it is a uh, dimension of this information is reduced to actually only seven dimensions. And then this seven dimensional space is expanded to 3,600 dimensions. Uh, 3,600 is the, uh, means the number of data points inside for a single image. So this uh, wave function interference pattern is transformed to 3,600 uh, dimensional uh, space, a data, one single point in uh, 3,600 dimensional space. And then it is reduced to seven dimension. And then it is expanded to 3,600 dimensional again and uh, to reproduce the original one. And then we input the magnetoconductance to this network and reduce it also to seven dimensions. So that this seven dimensional di uh, uh, point, uh, a point in the seven dimension can correctly uh, uh, reproduce the uh, uh, scattering state image. So that is our uh, Y-shaped neural network. Perhaps for those who are not familiar with this, uh, maybe a bit, bit uh, confusing or uh, difficult to understand what we did. But uh, uh, just remember that uh, directly uh, reproducing the image of the scattering state from the magnetoconductance doesn't go well. So instead, we first train the neural network 
along this direction. And then we combine, we input the uh, magnetoconductors so that it reproduces the uh, scattering state corresponding to this uh, uh, magnetoconductor. Tommy, may I yes. ask you for maybe for very simple words? When you go on the usual way in machine learning, you go uh, from what, from each level, you decrease dimension. In some sense, yes, you yeah. multiply yeah. the matrix, you multiply it by some numbers, by some rows, yeah. and you obtain less data. So in this direction, it is clear. What yeah. is the opposite direction? How can you start from seven dimensions, seven numbers, and go back to 3,600 numbers? Oh, yeah, uh, it's a kind of inverse convolution. So as you uh, as you said, usually we consider a cell inside the image and make the cell smaller and smaller for the deep learning. Uh, but uh, for the seventh dimension, we consider a function which expands the single point to uh, uh, many points. And by doing so again and again, we can enlarge the dimension of the system. Okay. Uh, 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 the detailed network structure uh, will appear uh, later. So I will explain it to you. Okay. Yeah, thanks for asking. Usually uh, we consider this process. The original data is compressed to a smaller dimension. And this all, uh, variational autoencoder, VAE, then reproduce the original data uh, uh, by expanding the dimension. So the important in information is compressed to a small dimension. And uh, in fact, to reproduce this image, we don't need uh, 3,600 dimension, but only seven is enough. Let me go further. Uh, the variational autoencoder uh, reproduce the original scattering state, reduce it to seven dimension, and generate from seven dimensional point, we generate the 60 by 60, 3,600 dimensional vector or 60 by 60 image. And this is because we extracted the feature of this wave function pattern, which uh, where only seven dimensional uh, uh, data is uh, enough. So first we uh, train this neural network and as Victor asked, uh, we first do the convolution to make it seven dimension, and then uh, we expand it to reproduce the uh, uh, original image. And after after uh, this neural network is established by training the neural network with eight thousand scattering state, then the parameter of this neural network is fixed they are not uh, no longer trained and then we train the neural network between the magnetoconductance and this uh, seven dimensional space we call it latent space so we uh, uh, train the neural network between the magnetoconductance we took the data point with 100 uh, uh, we didn't uh, continuously measure the conduct, uh, conductance, but uh, we, we uh, this is uh, 101 conductance, magnetoconductance. So magnetic field is meshed to be 101. And from this data, the 101 dim uh, this uh, figure or magnetoconductance is, is now indicate a point in 101 dimensional space. And then this 101 dimensional space data point is reduced to, uh, again, seven, uh, seven dimension. 
can, uh, we can, we train the neural network so that this seven dimensional uh, space point we produce the original scattering state. This is the detail of the neural network. Uh, 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 so uh, as Victor told uh, question, the original data is uh, now uh, doing the convolution and the dimension is reduced. Then this seven dimension is expanded to the 2048 dimension and so on. And then we reshape the data and uh, reproduce the uh, data point. So uh, this is uh, my answer to Victor. The seventh dimensional space is now mapped to 2048 by the kind of inverse convolution. Then uh, uh, we train this part. The 101 uh, uh, dimensional space is now reduced to, again, seventh dimension. You might ask why it is seven. Uh, the answer is that uh, we couldn't do better. We, we couldn't reproduce the figure for six or less dimension. And six dimension, uh, seven dimension is rather natural because to indicate the position of the antidote, we need X and Y axis. And for the quantum interference pattern, uh, we need uh, the um, uh, amplitude of the wave function, uh, amplitude of the oscillation, as well as KX and KY, the wave number and the phase of the uh, 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 interference. So at least we need at least six parameters. So uh, it is natural that we have uh, more than six dimensions. I don't know the, why it is not six, but seven. But uh, 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 we couldn't uh, reproduce nicely the original figure with uh, six dimensions. So that is... Uh, this seventh dimension is a tri and error product. So uh, now this is the uh, position of the antidote and the quantum interference uh, scattering state uh, corresponding to this uh, 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 position of the antidote. Now, if we apply the magnetic field then we have this magneto fingerprint. From this magnetic magneto fingerprint, we can reproduce the uh, uh, quantum in, uh, scattering state, which uh, where the position of the antidote is nicely reproduced, and we can also prepare the uh, we can also reproduce the interference pattern. They are not exactly the same. You see, the pattern here and the pattern here are not exactly the same. But uh, still, uh, it reproduces something similar to the original uh, interference pattern. So uh, this neural network works fine to reproduce the uh, input. Uh, magneto conduct from the input magneto conductor, we can reproduce the scattering state. Okay. And then uh, uh, this is not a single example, but uh, for many uh, interference patterns, uh, there is a, a magneto conductance calculation uh, between them. So this is the original position of the magneto uh, antidote and the uh, uh, scattering state corresponding to the uh, to this uh, configuration. And then we uh, calculate the magneto conductance, forget about this uh, uh, position, but we can reproduce the interference pattern from the magneto conductor. So 
So uh, the uh, traditional uh, simple deep neural network or inverse uh, uh, deep neural network where the dimension is expanded doesn't reproduce well the original position of the uh, uh, antidote, but uh, our Y-shaped uh, neural network uh, nicely reproduce uh, the quantum interference pattern from the magnetoconductor. Okay, that's uh, uh, the main uh, part of my talk. And uh, the rest of my talk is to discuss what we are looking at. That is, uh, to analyze this uh, seven-dimensional space. Okay, uh, so uh, do you have uh, uh, any question? Okay. Uh, Yes. Uh, so, so uh, just to clarify, you still have uh, you want to tell the details, right? This is not the end. Uh, you, you mean the detail of the neural network? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, I skipped it, but this is uh -huh, one uh -huh. of the details. The detail of the neural network. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, because I I, I mis misunderstood. Um, so, so in that case, uh, let us first, before we go to questions, let us uh, thank uh, Professor. No, 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 no. I, I haven't finished. Ah, no. Oh, I, I okay. have. Uh, <laughs> I finished okay. the first part, the yeah, main part, but I ha uh, still have uh, uh, something to tell you. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, I, I'm, sorry. Is, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. It was my uh, misunderstanding. Yeah, my statement was a bit confusing. But, but, uh, uh, but uh, now we discuss the property of the seven dimensional space. But seven dimension, seven dimension is still too large for, uh, for us. We need to reduce it to three dimensions. And there is a technique called uh, T SUNI, T distributed stochastic uh, neighbor embedding. Uh, there is a known, uh, well-known technique for machine learning to, for dimensional reduction. So we apply this uh, technique T SUNI to visualize the seven-dimensional space. So the T SUNI do the following. Uh, this is the original data, Xi which is a seven dimensional space. So J runs from one to D equals seven. And I indicates the number of samples. So each input sample or interference, uh, uh, each antidote position uh, corresponds to the seven dimensional uh, point, corresponds to a point in seventh dimension. And then uh, uh, we have uh, many number of samples, actually it's uh, 8,000, almost 8,000 samples. So I runs from one to 8,000. Now, the, this is the original point in the seventh dimension, seven dimensional space. And Z is a reduced dimension, which is one, two, three, and three. So it's a three dimensional space and each sample corresponds to a point in the three-dimensional space. So the number of sample n is the same, or a number of the data points are the same. We map x to j, uh, we map x to z, so that the distance between x and x prime is similar to the distance between z and z prime. And this is how we do the uh, uh, dimensional reduction from higher dimension to uh, smaller dimension, lower dimension. Detail of this TC I skip and uh, jump to the result. So uh, this is the result of the three dimensional embedding of the seven dimensional space. And here the configuration of the quantum interference pattern is reduced to seven dimension, which is correspond to this point uh, in three dimension. If we move this antidote, 
the position goes to this. So it seems that uh, the structure of this surface or a manifold, I should say, the structure of this manifold, some direction corresponds to the change of the position of the second uh, vertical position of the second antidote. Uh, to uh, understand this uh, uh, manifold more, we consider an uh, extreme example where we don't have any interference pattern, but we only have antidote. Then the uh, uh, manifold becomes just a, a kind of a surface. Now, uh, if we this uh, this uh, antidote configuration correspond to this point. Now, if we move this vertically, no, horizontally, the point moves to here. If we move this vertically, the point goes around this. So this uh, surface uh, very explain uh, this surface corresponds to the description of the position of the antidote. If we have a interference pattern, then uh, this is no longer a sheet or a surface, but have a uh, manifold where we have a thickness in the three-dimensional space. So the thickness seems to correspond to the quantum collection or a quantum interference pattern. So that, that is the interpretation of the seventh dimensional space or seventh dimensional space mapped to the three dimension. Okay, now the last part of my talk is about experimental results. So we, uh, the, uh, Experimental people have, uh, can prepare the antidote with this size and uh, uh, with uh, uh, gold in gold nanowire or quantum wire. The uh, geometry are similar. The scale is uh, different, 10 times different, but they are uh, in, uh, the scale change is uh, absorbed as the a scale change of that uh, wave number or uh, wavelength and the size of the quantum dot. Uh, so we start with this experiment, measure the magnetoconductance experimentally at 30 millikelvin. And then we already train the neural network numerically. So we input this magnetoconductance, and uh, then the neural network reproduce or the output uh, interference uh, pattern like this. The position of the first dot is okay. The second dot position, uh, it is uh, somewhat vert, uh, horizontally displaced. The position of the horizontal direction isn't perfect. But uh, the vertical position seems to be okay. And this is uh, so far the uh, 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 situation with the experiment. And to summarize my talk, uh, we have shown that this Y shaped neural network generates a wave function or scattering state from the uh, magnetoconductor. We have visualized the property of this reduced seven dimensional space, latent space. Now, the weak point is that, uh, as I told you, it is restricted to two antidote cases. And the more general application is so far not possible. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, please. Okay, uh, let's thank first uh, Professor. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Um, okay, uh, ah. questions. Sergey, uh, 
okay, sorry, I thought you had a question. Okay. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Sergey, please. I do have a, a, a general question. Uh, so these uh, <clears throat> uh, these uh, neural network uh, routines, uh, in some sense, uh, as you showed, you reduce the dimension substantially uh, right. to the needed one. So they basically are some kind of uh, correlation archiving routines, uh, which uh, are, are also fuzzy, however. So meaning that uh, they don't work all the time. Uh, so one can usually try to quantify the success or failure rate of, of, the, uh, of, of, of the trained routine. Uh, can you comment on that? Because you showed one example at the end where the second antidote didn't, uh, uh, by, by looking at this, we could see that it doesn't uh, sit in the right position, but you probably, maybe if you do much more uh, tests and calculations, uh, you could come up with some uh, quantitative um, a statement about the the quality of the prediction. Uh, you mean prediction to the experimental data? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, we don't actually we don't have many samples so far. Mm -hmm. uh, because experimental is quite difficult to prepare. Uh, yeah, but, uh, sure, but, but, but you could even, uh, I mean, you train your network with a certain set of uh, uh, samples, right? Yes, well, yeah, yes, uh, it's 8,000 samples. Yeah, but you could generate more samples, which you then use as test uh, uh, samples. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that, that, that test is quite satisfactory. The numerical testing is quite satisfactory. That's what I, I'm asking. What means quite satisfactory? Can you quantify this? Oh, and yes. If, uh, oh. So the quite successful is that uh, the difference between the input and output is uh, uh, similar. And similar in the sense that the distribution functions uh, is uh, the, uh, how can I say, the KL divergence, uh, or uh, let's say the distribution functions uh, of this and this are similar. It, it, uh, it is not a simple mean square variance between this input and output, but it is uh, 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 rather the difference uh, between the input and output uh, distribution of the image. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, 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 you can also think that uh, this is uh, difference is uh, qual uh, qualitatively the same as mean square di uh, difference. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Sung Jong. Sung Jong, please unmute yourself. Oh, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering if, there's, if it's possible to inverse engineer uh, the structure of the anti dot uh, to produce some specific, uh, what is it, the magneto uh, resistance, magneto conductance uh, pattern that one wants. Mm -hmm. So you want some magneto conductance pattern and by using this neural network, is it possible to uh, put, uh, reverse engineer the position of the antidote? Oh, yes. I mean, maybe yeah. like I'm wondering. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did, did you try some like random pattern of the magnetic conductance to be, uh, uh, No, uh, I didn't. To try the random pattern of magnetic conductance, uh, but if you uh, input this, uh, if you uh, input the magnetic conductance pattern, then uh, it will predict uh, uh, something like this or something like this. The first position of the antidote is fixed, uh, uh -huh. but oh, the I second see. position is predicted. And uh, if we follow this uh, step and you prepare this. Uh, sample with uh, mm -hmm. uh, two antidotes here and here, you can reproduce the original input uh, magnetoconductor. So yes, 
we can reverse engineer the position of the magnet or uh, uh, no, antidote position. Okay, so thank you. Uh, perhaps uh, let me ask something. So, uh, uh, what about uh, now uh, taking also the the fixed uh, dot anti dot and moving it around? Uh, have you tried? Uh, uh, how how does it does it work? If if both do anti dots are uh, kind of arbitrarily, yeah, if both of them are uh, uh, changing, uh, it seems that our training. Uh, data they uh, are too short uh, to too, uh, the number of the training data is too small we uh -huh. have only 8000 yeah we have only 8000 uh, uh, scattering state and magnetoconductor and uh, so far it is the limit of our calculation mm -hmm. uh, if we change both the position of the two antidotes i think we need the hundreds of uh, more uh, number of samples. That means millions of samples to learn mm -hmm. about the feature of the two antidotes. And also the latent space. This latent space will be will not be seven dimensional, but will be about uh, 13 or 14 dimensions. Uh -huh, so because the of the additional. That, yeah, parameters. additional degree of freedom. So uh, uh, interpreting this latent space will also be will become uh, difficult. And that is why we stick to the case, uh, uh, to stick to the case where the first position of the antidote is fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tommy, I wanted to ask with prospects for the future activity of our advanced study group. So in a sense, yes. you have in science, you have double teaching. You teach your network twice. You have yes, your Hamiltonian, right. and you also have some measurements for your Hamiltonian. So if I would say that we are talking about the Hamiltonian, which corresponds to a crystal, and then we have some measurements, I don't know, of conductance, which corresponds to the same crystal. And then let's say that we have, instead of crystallic phase, you have, let's say, Anderson insulator. And so... Is it, it looks like it is possible to teach the system to distinguish between different phases in the sense that you have done before for the topological insulators, just according to the measurement some physical, of some physical quantity of conductance. It looks, it's possible to hope for this, to distinguish between different phases according to the fluctuation, so to the noise of the measurement. Yeah, but uh, you know, Victor, uh, if it is Anderson localized, the conductor, it, it, uh, we know that it is an insulator without using the neural network, that, but the average value of the conductance is enough. I see. Yeah, so, so in our case, it is a diffusive uh, region where Anderson localization haven't started yet. I see. I and we don't know the value of the conductance. Uh, maybe we can apply your idea to different situations. But for Anderson localization, I, I, didn't, conductor... I, I didn't mean particular Anderson, just said a word. Yeah. What I wanted is the difference between different phases according to the measurement. Okay, so mm. it's like this. Yeah. Thank you very much, really. Yeah, uh, we can also discuss the time series, which is usually ignored. I mean, uh, uh, for example, if we do the Monte Carlo simulation, uh, we wait until the equilibrium is reached. Uh, but uh, we can use the neural network to analyze the initial uh, several steps and predict the final phase. I see. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. F which is much more convenient and efficient because we, didn't need, we don't need to wait until the equilibrium is reached. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I add a, a follow-up question? Can you remind please again, uh, how is the magic number seven coming up uh, per uh, antidote? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I can explain only six. 
Uh, but okay. let me do. Okay, six is fine. <laughs> so, also. Okay. The six. X and Y position of the antidote. So we need yes. at least two variables. Yes. We have this uh, interference pattern. And uh, so we need uh, amplitude of the interference and the kx and the ky, uh, mm -hmm. the wave number in two directions, and the phase. So that makes us uh, six. Okay. So uh, uh, more than six is natural, but I, I don't see. know why seven is enough. Okay, seven is close to six. Okay, yeah. sounds reasonable. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any further questions or comments? In case not, uh, let us thank uh, Professor Oktsuki for his excellent talk. Uh, uh, thank you very much. So with this, uh, we conclude our uh, today's seminar. Uh, so uh, Victor, uh, do you want to uh, add something uh, as, as the ending of? I really appreciate the participation of all, all, all participants today and uh, the members of this SG group. And we hope to continue and we enjoy every seminar which you send us, not just our group seminars. So I will be glad to participate next week as well. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Uh, so let me just... Uh...